It's Sunday morning, and our subject this morning is the doctrine of predestination. It's the most controversial doctrine that has been taught out of the Bible ever since the Bible was written over the thousands of years it was written. People hate the doctrine of predestination. The reason they hate it is they think God is somebody that he is not. <clears throat> this is what the church taught. The Protestant church taught this. The Baptists taught it. The Presbyterians taught it. The Congregationalists taught it. The Puritans taught this message. The Reformers taught this. They taught the doctrine of the sovereignty of God that God was ruling and doing everything. We are living in a time today of the apostasy. The word apostasy is the word apostasis. Now, whenever I write these words down, I am writing down what is the original Greek text. Now, the reason I've had people say, what's he talking about Greek for? Because the New Testament was written in the Greek. English is only about 1,100 years old. English began to be developed about the 4th, 5th century A.D., but it wasn't uh, actually developed. We didn't really get developed English language till about 1,100 years ago. New Testament was written in Greek. All the culture was the Greek or Roman or Hebrew cultures of the day. You have to go back 2,000 years to find out what they meant when they said something. We say something and it doesn't exactly go with our language and our way of thinking. We say, well, that guy sure is cool. We don't mean he's 38 degrees Fahrenheit, do we? That's not what we mean. Or we'll say we have many, many sayings. We used to, back when I was a kid, if some guy was kind of crooked or a liar, we would say he's slick. We didn't mean he had oil all over his body. Well, the, the same goes for the Bible. We've got hundreds and hundreds of idioms and metaphors that we use every day in the English language. They had the same thing in the Bible and you have to go back to the culture, to the day, to find out what these words, what these sayings meant. Now this word apostasis is our word apostasy. Apostasy. Paul said the day of the Lord there in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 the day of the Lord will not come. And he, when he's talking about the day of the Lord, he's talking about the previous chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, when the Lord will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. You have to be obedient to the gospel in order to escape the judgment and the wrath of God. That word apostasis, that word falling away, he, Paul says the day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. We're in the falling away. We are in the apostasy now. That word apostasis is a construction of the word apo, which means a removal, removal of, and the word stasis, stasis. Stasis is a word in the Greek that has many uh, morphemes. Morpheme is, comes from the word morphe, meaning shape. There are many word shapes that are associated with this word stasis. You have the word stao, stao, the word histome. Histome means to stand, stand. Stao means upright. And that's what this word, that's a combination of these two words. It means to stand upright, stasis, stand upright. There's going to be a removal of standing upright. And from this word stasis, we also get the word staros. And staros is the word cross. There has to be a removal of the, not the cross of Jesus in the sense of the one he died on. Everyone believes that Jesus died on a cross. Most everyone. The Catholics believe that. That's not going to take them to heaven. The Baptists believe that. The Pentecostals believe that. The Church of Christ believe that. The Presbyterians believe that. The Episcopals believe that. That sounds like everybody gets to go to heaven, doesn't it? Everybody's not going to heaven. There has to be a removal of the daily cross. That's what there's a removal of. And men hate this daily cross, according to the third chapter of Philippians, because 
They mind earthly things. The word mind is the word phroneo, P-H-R-O-N-E-O. Phroneo is the word, it means sentiment. Their sentiment, their desire is for earthly. The word earthly is the word gay, G-E. It means dirt, soil. They like dirt. They like soil. I was standing in the grocery store the other day and I I just looking around, I got to thinking, I, I just wanted to say, hey, everything here is dirt. You're, you're dirt, I'm dirt. This cash register is dirt. Those flowers over there are dirt. And all this food is dirt, and that's, those are dirt cars out there in the yard. And, and this building is dirt, and your house is dirt, and the bank is dirt. They're going to give you a dirt paycheck when you leave. <laughs> and you're going to take it and deposit it in a bank that's made out of dirt, and a teller that's made out of dirt is going to take it. Men like tangible things they can touch. They want boats, heart, cars, houses, things, stuff, diamonds. A diamond, like the old say, is an old piece of coal under pressure is all it is. It's just coal. Would you wear a piece of coal on your finger? What's so amazing, everything in the universe is made out of the same stuff called atoms. Everything. An atom is just a... And there's no such thing as diamond atoms and dung atoms. There's no such thing. They're the same atoms. It just depends. You've got a nucleus of an atom. You've got neutrons and protons in a nucleus. And it depends on how many protons and neutrons. And you've got these little orbits of electrons around here. And, of course, the neutrons don't have a charge. The protons have a positive charge. The electrons have a negative charge. And it depends on what other what other uh, atoms that they have connected to or bonded with, whether it, makes, whether it makes them dumb or a diamond on your finger, or whether it makes it a piece of wood out there in a tree. It just depends. It's all the same stuff. Dung, everything is the same thing as dung. Everything. There's nothing out there that's not dung. Paul said, I, I count all things... Everything that I, that I have ever accomplished in life, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I'm a Pharisee, my father was a Pharisee, I was circumcised the eighth day of Israel, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, which is one of the greatest honors, I was in, the southern, I was in southern Judah. He said, all these things I count but dung that I might gain Christ, the word is skubalon, S-K-U-B-A-L-O-N, that's the word right there, skubalon. Same thing. It's all dung, everything. Now, there has been a removal of the daily cross because people like all this dung. That's what they like. Everything you see is made of the same thing. Your car, a brand new Mercedes is made out of the same stuff as an old beat-up Chevrolet. You know that, don't you? It doesn't matter. In fact, a whole lot of Mercedes got beat-up Chevrolets in, in the metal. So we are living in a time that the apostasy has come about. This is why men don't like the doctrine of predestination. They think God is somebody that he's not. They don't want a daily cross. Paul says that when you look over there in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, he says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, I've heard that read by many, many preachers, and I never understood that in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness, but unto us, to us believers, to us the elect, it is the power of God. Now, to those that perish, the cross is foolishness. The daily cross, he's not talking about, he's not talking about the cross that Jesus died on because most people believe that's a historical fact that Jesus died on the cross. The cross that men hate is the one that Jesus spoke about in Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny. You cannot come after Christ without denying self. And take up, up your cross... He has to deny self, take up cross, and follow me. 
Now, you say, Jim, isn't that for especially good Christians? No, that's for every believer. If you don't have a cross, Jesus said, my favorite verse to talk to people about when I go out in public is Luke 14, 27. I, they, I, they'll argue about predestination. They'll argue about whether Christmas is, whether Christmas is uh, pagan or not. They'll argue about whether Easter is pagan. But one thing they can't do is when Jesus says, He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. You're, you can't be mine. You're no part of me if you do not bear your cross and follow me. And then I'll look at somebody and I'll say, do you know what a cross is? Do you know where to get one? I've never had anybody say, yeah, I know what one is. Every one of them go. No matter if they're a Baptist or a Church of Christ or Pentecostal, I don't know. You cannot hate the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ, Paul says in Galatians the 6th chapter, is the cross by which the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The cross is the daily cross, the one that Jesus spoke of in Luke 9.23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, this word deny, take up, and follow, they're all what we call imperative moods in the Greek. Imperative mood. Now, an imperative mood is not an option. It is a command to everyone that has an ear to hear. In fact, every time the Bible says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. That is also a command. And where are you going to get an ear to hear? Well, Proverbs, Proverbs tells us that, that uh, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. If you can hear and see the truth, God has to give you that ear and that ability to hear. This is what predestination is about. God picks His family. He births them by His will. He doesn't birth you by your will. You cannot be born again by your will. You don't have any will to do anything good. How are you going to do anything right when the Bible says there's none that understands, there's none that seeketh after God? If nobody seeks God, how are you ever going to seek Him if He leaves you alone to your will? How are you going to seek God? You can't seek God. How can you do that? Isaiah 64 and 7, Isaiah said, There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Nobody calls upon the name of the Lord and stirreth up himself. U-W-R is the word stirreth up. In the theological word book of the Old Testament, the writers, Mr. Archer and, and Walkie and Harris, tell us that this word ur means to wake from the dead. If you are dead in trespasses and sin, how are you going to wake yourself from the dead to call upon the God? This always takes us to Romans 10, 13. The favorite verse of all the Baptists I was raised around, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That sounds like the method of salvation, doesn't it? It's not. Read the next verse, which is the next sentence. How then shall they call on Him in whom they've not believed? How are you going to start praying to a God you don't believe in? Do I believe? Am I going to pray to Zeus any moment here? Am I going to pray to Adonis? Or am I going to pray to Hercules, one of these gods of the ancient world? No, I'm not. I don't believe they exist. And if you don't believe God exists until He brings you alive by His will, we were born. John 1, 13. One of my favorite verses. I don't know how men get around this. Speaking of a new birth, Jesus came unto His own. His own received Him not, but as many as received Him... To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Man is born by the will of God. Yeah, but doesn't it say as many as received him? That word received there is the word lambano, means to take hold of. Lambano, as many as received him, to them gave he the power. Well, that word lambano means to take hold of, but remember, you've got to compare that verse with Isaiah 64, 7. The Bible says that there is none that, that calls upon His name or that wakes Himself whole, well, up to take hold of God, to take hold. You can't say, Mommy, hold my hand until you are alive and a little boy or a little girl. You can't say that until you're born, can you? 
You absolutely cannot. So, so when he says deny self, that's a command to every one of God's believers. Or naomai, or actually op, A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. It means a complete setting off of denial. That word deny means to contradict. You have to contradict self. You say, what do you mean contradict self? Everything that you think God is. You've got to forget that. You've got to pick up the Bible. Whatever the Bible says God is, you have to believe that. He's a great and mighty and a terrible God, all the prophets said. Uh, that He is uh, he's a God to be feared. We're to fear Him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. People say, well, God don't want anybody to fear Him. Certainly He does. When Moses came near to the mountain, when he went up to the mountain to get the law from God, the Bible says he was exceedingly afraid. Then Hebrews 9, the word exceedingly afraid is ek phobeo. Phobeo is our word phobia. It actually it doesn't mean just have a slight fear of something. Ek means out. It means to be frightened out of one's wits. That's how Moses felt about facing the... How do, you, how do you think you're going to feel coming up to the judgment and facing God? You're going to get face down. How can men live in this life without being face down to God? How do they live? They have no fear of God. If God's never struck fear in your heart, you don't know Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We're to fear Him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. The word yare is the Old Testament word fear, Y-A-R-E. And the Bible speaks and says, by the fear of the Lord, men will depart from evil. You have to fear God to depart from evil. When you don't fear God, you think God is somebody who you want Him to be. He's not. He's not who you want Him to be. Well, this is something you have to do. Deny self. You have to contradict everything you think. In order to come to the conclusion that predestination is true, I have to pick up this book, look at it, and say, here's what the Bible says. My mama says this. My daddy says this. My brother and sister says this. And God, this is the way I feel in the 20th, 21st century. I just don't think God is that bad. And God says, I am that bad. That's what you have to come to. You've got to pick up the Bible, go by the Bible, and don't go by your thoughts. You know why people... They think God is somebody, don't they? He said, your thoughts aren't my thoughts in Isaiah 55. Your ways aren't my ways. You can't think like I think. Why would God send somebody to hell on purpose? Well, he says he does all things after the counts of his own will. I just don't think God could do that. Let me ask you this. If God had a wanted to, could God have created Adam perfect in the garden where he couldn't have sinned? Where he couldn't have sinned? Okay, is he, can he, create, is he going to create, create us in eternity where we can't sin? Well, why didn't he do it from the beginning? He didn't, want to. he didn't want to. He has a program. Our names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And if he was, he only died for his wife, the church. He didn't die for everybody. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Nobody else. The man in hell is dying for his own sin. Did God understand that? Did God know all of that? Well, certainly He did. So we have to deny, take, and follow. This is what happens after He births us by His will. Of His own will begat He us. You can't birth yourself. Have you, is, anybody here, is anybody here alive? Okay. <laughs> Did anybody here have anything to do with birthing yourself and bringing yourself alive? No. Nobody brings themselves alive. No one. We're birthed by the word born again. When Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. The word again is the word anoth. And A-N-O-T-H-E-N. It means from above. Well, if our birth comes from God... How could it come by our will from us? It does not. It takes a lot of crucifying self to believe God, doesn't it? It's from above. The word anno means above. Above. 
This word, that's the word again, you must be born again. It doesn't mean you can walk the aisle and be born of your own will. You can do that. Did I walk the aisle? More than any human being in this room. My father was an old country Baptist preaching. He'd stand over the pulpit. And if you don't know tonight, uh, this may be your last chance. Uh, we're going to sing one more verse of uh, uh, Just As I Am. Uh, and after we get through that, we're going to sing 15 verses of Almost Persuaded. And then we're going to sing another 10 of Softly and Tenderly. And I heard that until it scared the life out of me. I kept, has anybody heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> What's so amazing, some people don't even... Like the old Mormon over here, she didn't even know it went on, did she? <laughs> she said, I never heard, she said, I never heard accept Christ and walk the aisle, raise a Jehovah's Witness and turned, up, turned into a Mormon and then she became one of us. Because she was elect. She thought it was all crazy when she's in there. I had to get toasted on each side. <laughs> But some people have never heard of this. Those of us have seen it. It's nothing but confusion. I resent that more than I resented anything in my life. My father to stand up there. First of all, how can you confuse a little kid, a little baby? If you say, I may not be your father, maybe I'm not your Maybe he's your father. Get out of here. You're certainly going to confuse him, but does that keep you from being their father? No. And I worried about that every day. I worried about it at school as a 12, 13, 14 year old kid. I worried about it when I saw a white cloud in the sky. I thought Jesus was going to split and roll it open. It's not true. God has an elect family. He said, everyone is going to come to me. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me in John 6, 37. Every one of them is going to come to me. And he that cometh to me, I want to know why is cast out. So you have to belong to God. And Jesus told the Pharisees in John 10, they came to us and they said, How long wilt thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, I told you. I've already told you. And you will not believe because you are not of my sheep. I'm not going to invite you in. You don't belong to me. Get away from me. He didn't invite the Pharisees in. He told them they were children of hell. He didn't say, Peter, come up here and sing, Just as I am. Won't you come? Won't you come? They can't hear. Isn't that ridiculous? If you wonder why people laugh at this, because you've seen it, hadn't you? Coming out of our ears. And I had to wake up one day and say, Lord, what's really amazing, I've told this story. My father started preaching in 1949. I was born in 1939. For those first 10 years of my life, we went to Methodist churches that didn't beg people down the aisle. I remember walking out and I'll never forget, it's about 1947, I walked out during a spring moon after we got out of a Methodist church and I just was listening to the message and I, when I said, I love you, Jesus, I love you with all my heart and I want to go to heaven with you someday. And I really believed that as a kid. Nobody had told me to accept Christ yet or pray some sinner's prayer. But I was believing God and praying to Him somewhere about 1947. And that wasn't the time I was born again. I don't know when it was. Babies are too young to know when they're born. They just start, open their eyes and they start seeing and they start hearing and they start believing, don't they? When Daddy started preaching in 1949, he started giving those death threat messages. If you don't get saved tonight, this may be your last chance. I kept trying to do something that I already had. That's the point. That's why it upset me so bad. I didn't know how to get this Jesus into my life that he was talking about. That's the other Jesus. There's two Jesus in the Bible. You better find out which one you serve. Paul said some will come preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel there in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. And he goes on to tell you that this is Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. Transform metaschematizo means to disguise oneself. Satan is only going to fool people Whenever he disguises himself and he looks like Jesus, it's only way to deceive. The whole world is immersed in this other Jesus. All the churches in America are immersed in it. Martin Luther would turn over in his grave if he knew what people had done to his name. So would John Calvin, so would Thomas Watson. You want to read somebody that will break your heart, make you go crawl in a hole, read Thomas Watson. He didn't preach like these preachers today. Cut into your heart, hurt you bad. So we have to deny, contradict ourselves, 
And we have to take up our cross. A-I-R-O means to lift up in the air. You had to be condemned to a cross in the first century. Where do you get a cross? You're predestined to a cross. Aren't we? The Bible says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. God has a people, a whom's. He had a whom's that He foreknew, prognosco. Pro before and gnosko means to know intimately beforehand. God knew His family before the world began. That's what the Bible says. He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. I ain't never heard a preacher read that at Bleeding Free Will. Ephesians 1 and 4, have you? How about the next verse, verse 5? Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. He has predestinated us unto the Adoption, H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. Huios is the word sons. And tithome means to place. It means to place sons. You didn't place yourself as a son or a daughter in your own family and you're not going to place yourself in the family of God by trying to accept Christ or pray a sinner's prayer. Accept Christ in sinner's prayer is nowhere in the Bible. Did the uh, Pharisee pray, and, or did the uh, publican pray and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner? Yes. How could he call on a God he didn't believe in? He couldn't, could he? He was already a believer when he said, God be merciful to me. Do you think that's a one-time prayer? Do you know how often I pray that prayer? God be merciful to me. I know the sin that I have been in my past. You ever pray that prayer besides the night you supposedly got saved? There's no such thing as got saved. Saved is the word sozo. It's not something you get one Sunday night in a Baptist church when the preacher gives a long invitation to him. Sozo means to be taken from one point all the way to another point and to be preserved and protected from all the dangers throughout that entire deliverance. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And He's chosen us to be saved before the foundation of the world. Who set this thing up? Who set up that tree in the garden? Who, who made that tree there? And who made Satan with a glitch in him? And who made Adam with a glitch in him so he would sin? God! And who set up this program? God! Couldn't He have done it different? So He wouldn't lose any? He said, I'm not going to lose any of mine. Of all that the Father giveth me, I should lose nothing. I thought God wasn't willing that any should perish. That's not what it says in the original text. Boy, that's everybody. That in John 3.16 is everybody's favorite verse. Isn't it? 2 Peter 3.9 When scoffers come and they look at us as believers. You got scoffers and you got believers. And they look at us believers and they say, Where is this promise of your Messiah's coming? Why, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And then Peter writes these words. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise that you're making accusation that He's not coming. God's not slack concerning His promise wherein some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any of us should perish. The answer is to the scoffers. We're answering him. God's not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish. Any of the elect should perish. That's what the 18th chapter of Matthew says. Any is a pronoun. A pronoun has to have an antecedent. An antecedent is the noun or pronoun it refers back to. It refers back to us. God's not willing that any of us should perish. They, we're talking to the scoffers, answering their accusation, where is the promise of your Messiah's coming? And we say to them, God's not willing that any of us should perish. If there's a man over there in the 18th chapter of Matthew, and he's got a hundred sheep and one is away from the fold, the shepherd leaves 
and goes and finds that sheep. When the sheep gets away from the fold and he gets lost, does that make him a goat? I mean, he's way out here on the side of the hill over here, and here's the shepherd over here. <clears throat> as soon as he gets lost, lost, and away from the rest of the flock, does that make him a goat? No! He's a lost sheep, and then Jesus says in that same parable, He said, it's not the Father's will that one of these little ones should perish. Not one of His flock will perish. They were His, given to Him from the foundation of the world. That's the truth. I'm giving you verses out of a King James Bible, not out of a cult book. Why is it I can find these verses and they can't? Why is it I can pay attention to what it says and they can't? I got fed up with it. I had to throw out, you believe that because your father taught that. My father didn't believe anything. He was a Baptist preacher. He'd read three verses and tell stories for 45 minutes. I got sick of that. I had to deprogram year after year after year. It took a long time to get most of that garbage out of my mind because I had to study the Word of God. My father didn't study. You say, are you just giving him a hard time? I'm telling you. You better not listen to your parents unless they know the truth. And it has to be borne out in Scripture. Don't listen to your preacher because he says something. Their favorite thing is accept Christ as your personal Savior. You can't accept Christ as your personal Savior. None seeks after God. You're dead in sin. With what kind of a will can you accept God into your life when you're dead? There's none that seeks after God. How are you going to do it? You're dead. You don't want it. If you ever get the want to or the will, where's it going to come from? It has to come from God. Are you willing to believe God when you believe Him? Yes. Where does the will come in? Psalms 110.3 Thy people, thy is a possessive pronoun. He owns them. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. When God's power moves in, that's like when he said there in John 1, 11, when he says he came into his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, or as many that has taken hold of him. Remember, you can't take hold and wake yourself up until you're birthed. As many as received him, to them gave he the exousia ability ability to become sons of God from this word exousia we get the word ex e -S -T -I. existence means to be means to be and from this the base word e-i-n-a-i -I, which is the word to be if you be then you exist, don't you? Yes. That's what it is. If you be, you exist. If you be, you exist. I memorized these in about the 10th grade, about 1954, and I've never forgotten them. Here's the being verbs right here. Be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, be as our morals were being been, have, has, had, have, has, had, do, does, did, shall, you can write these down, shall, will, 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 will is a form of the verb to be, to exist. Shall, will, should, would, May, might, must, can, could. If, if you have any will, it is existence. If you have will, then you can exist on your own. Can't you? If you have the will to 
come to God. If He doesn't put it in you to turn to Him, you can't do it on your own. You cannot somewhere down inside conjure up a righteous will to come and believe Him. That can't be done. In fact, if you can conjure this up, that makes you Jehovah. Doesn't it? If you can exist of self, if you can will of your own self, because will is a form of the verb to be, to exist. If you can exist on your own, that makes you Jehovah. Jehovah, or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce that, I don't really care. Y-E-H-O-W-A-H. Yahweh. Jehovah means self existent. If you have a will to come alive and be self-existent and you can be on your own, be and will are forms of the same word. Did you know that? To be or to exist and will are forms of the same thing. If you can conjure up a will to do right inside of you, Paul said, he said in Romans seven eighteen. How to perform which, that which is good, I don't know how to do. Here I am writing 14 books of the New Testament, one more or less, I don't really care. I'm writing these books of the New Testament, I'm traveling as a minister of God, and I don't know how to do right. If God doesn't overcome me and overpower me, I won't do right. And neither will you, and neither will I. Well, let's get back over here where I was. All right, now. If any man will come after me, you must deny self. You must take up, bear up in the air, and you must follow me. Follow. A-K-O-U-L-O-T-H-E-O. Akulotheo. Akulotheo means to be in the same way, 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 way with. Way. How many ways are there? Huh? No? How many ways are there? There's two ways. One, in Matthew 7. I'm not talking about how many ways to heaven. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. There is a narrow way that leads to life and few, few, not many, few there be that find it. Not a worldwide revival. That's baloney. Whoever came up with that? Did you come up with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And there's a broad way that leads to destruction and many go in thereat. Most of the world is going to hell. Why? Because God fitted him for that. He fixed him for it. We're predestined to this narrow way. Because that is the daily cross. That's denying self. If you don't really believe these words, this is not an alternative way of believing the truth. It's the only truth. If you really cannot get a hold of these, you don't belong to God. Somewhere in your life you have to get a hold of the fact these words are true. You can't just come up and say, well, we've redefined this. That, don't, that ain't going to get you to heaven. You can redefine all you want to. You can call Christmas... Christmas if you want to, but it's the Feast of Saturn is what it is. You can't change the name. You can change the, you can change the name of your cat to pig and it ain't going to make it a pig. <laughs> it won't do any good. You can't just say, I'm going, I'm going skydiving. You get you an aqualung, you go dive down in the sea. Wait, that's, you've renamed that. That's not it. You can say an elephant is a little bug crawling again. I know that's a ladybug. You can rename anything you want to rename. That doesn't make it so. That's what the preachers have done. Who do you think you are, Jim? I don't think I'm anybody. I got fed up with the preachers. I've traveled all over this nation, preached in hundreds of churches across America, Baptist, Pentecostal. I've never met a preacher that had good sense concerning the Word of God. Not one that I can even discuss the Bible with. Just <laughs> praise God, young man. Well, hallelujah, and slap me on the back. Well, hey, hey man. Have you ever heard preachers do that? Yes. Next time when I'm does it, kick him in the shin. <laughs> Watch him dance. Say, stop that, you arrogant. 
You arrogant, self-righteous Pharisee. What do you mean? Ho, ho, ho. I'm, you sound like Santa Claus. Then. <laughs> I know you've heard that, Jim. I know y'all have heard it. Well, I don't know what that means. Well, praise God. Y'all heard that? Huh? It's ridiculous. Why can't you just talk say, hey, how you doing? I'm the same guy up here I am out in the parking lot. I don't get up here and say, I, I'd like to preach this morning on John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And psh, get out of here. <laughs> Nobody talks like that. Nobody talks like Adrian Rogers talks. And, and this morning, ha, ha, he does that. Ha, ha. I don't know if you ever heard him do that before he died, but he did. And well, this morning I'd like to say, uh, dear, as I come down the staircase, what's for breakfast this morning? You think he talk, talks his wife that way? No. Guys, why don't you guys learn to just talk and be yourself? Quit putting on these big round tones. It's ridiculous. I just want to slap those guys. I really do. Just say, stop that. There's nothing Christian out of putting on a tone in your voice. Nothing. Be yourself. Now, we're predestined to this cross here. This cross that men hate. This apostasy, they don't want the cross. A removal of the cross. The people, the whoms that God foreknew. He foreknew us, prognosco. That word means to know intimately be, beforehand whether anybody believes it or not. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate, prohorizo. Predestinate, people say, that's a very confusing word. It is not. It's only confusing if you don't like it. When you don't like something, it's confusing. Isn't it? If Mary don't like something to eat, she won't cook it for me. It's, if you don't like something, that's too bad. It is what it is. Predestination is what it is, and you can't change it. That's it. It is the word prohorizo. Pro is our prefix pre. <laughs> That's exactly our prefix pre. It means before. So the people that God foreknew, those are the ones that He has before horizoed. There are no H's in the Greek in the Greek alphabet. Just looking at the small letters only. Don't you don't have to really. Memorize the big letters like you do the small ones. Most of it's written in small. You won't find any H's, but you will find a diacritical mark that has a breathing sound, an H sound. Later on, there was an N added by the Latins. It means, it's our word horizon. It means to predetermine for the horizon. What is the horizon? Isn't that where the light shines? Huh? You have a horizon. The light is shining down here, right? The horizon is the demarcation between light, between light and dark, isn't it? Isn't that what it is? Isn't that the horizon? Well, Paul tells the, the Ephesians, you are darkness, but now are you light in the Lord, walk as children of light. You can't bring yourself to the light. You're in darkness and you like it. You love dirt. How can you bring yourself to light? You can't. You have to be brought to light and you have to be birthed into the light by God. And sometimes you start off real slow on your brand new believer and you keep falling back out and sin. You try to wander into the, the darkness. God says, get back over here. You belong to me. You decide to maybe go a little drinking, a little nightclub, and a little uh, dirty jokes at work or whatever. And God says, you belong to me and you're going to walk in the light and not in darkness. Well, that has to do with the definition of prison, doesn't it? Huh? Yes, sir. Prison, fulake, means the division of light and dark or day and night. Day and night. Well, that has the same meaning as horizon or horizo, doesn't it? And when you, when you get into the word forgive, forgiveness, we're talking about God predestinating His people 
to the light, which has to do with forgiveness. He's preordained your forgiveness. But that don't come free. Forgiveness is the word aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S, and it means to pardon and release from prison or release from darkness, release from dark or prison. So our predestination has to do with pre-lightning bringing us to forgiveness, but forgiveness isn't free, is it? Then why are you going around forgiving everybody? Let's forgive him. He stole our car. He came over and killed our dog. And let's forgive him. Let's know, the Bible says, the same way we have been forgiven, we need to forgive others. How were we forgiven? Well, first of all, we had to be rebuked, didn't we? We had to be corrected. Rebuked, E-L-E-G-C-H-O means to show evidence of guilt and then you have to in order to be forgiven you have to be rebuked and when you're rebuked you have to what? You have to repent. And that means to be turned and think differently. You see, you can't even turn yourself. Jeremiah said, he said there in Jeremiah 31, 18, Turn thou me and I shall be turned. And after I was turned, I repented. And then I was ashamed. Have you ever been ashamed of your sin? If you haven't, you haven't repented. And I think about my sin, I get embarrassed, my face turns red, and I just drop my head. Oh God, God, I wish I could go do that over again. I, I wish... I wish I had another chance to do that right. Oh, God, forgive me. Do you ever do that during the week? I do that. He can't remember our sin and you can't forget it. So you have to repent, but you have to be turned by God. By the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When he says goodness, Christatos, Christ altars has many, many variations of that word. It means usefulness. And what is useful to us is a derivative of that word, which is the word creo, which means to be anointed. It means to be covered over with a stain or a dye. It has the same meaning, basically, as the word baptize, baptizo and babto, And, and babto, both these words are translated over in our language into baptize. And this, and there's only one baptism, and baptize means to be covered with a stain or a dye. And a blood baptism was a martyrdom in the first century when Jesus tells James and John, Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Well, I thought Jesus was dipped in water. And what about the Ethiopian eunuch? They were dipped in water, and that was a proselyte baptism. I'm not going there right now. Got too, too much time. So, Christ has to baptize us. That's what's useful to us. You can't baptize yourself. He's got to wash us. He's washed us from our own sins in His own blood there in Revelation 1 and 5. He's willing the washing. We haven't washed ourselves by our free will, have we? We haven't baptized ourselves in the blood of Christ and come to a place where we say, I'm going to die daily. When you're living in sin, you don't like this idea of dying daily unless something overcomes you. And it has to be the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? So we are... Horizod beforehand, predetermined for the light, that's coming out of darkness to light, that is forgiveness, brought about by repentance that only God brings and He has to do the rebuking of us. So when you're predestined, you're predestined to be rebuked. He doesn't rebuke everyone. He's not really rebuking the Pharisees when He calls them children of hell. 
Rebuke is when he gives them ears to hear so they can understand. He is pronouncing judgment on them when he calls them children of hell. One of you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you comp you comp a sin land to make one proselyte after he's made you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You cannot bring yourself to God. It's impossible. You can't accept Christ either. That's a that's a fallacy. That's not in the Bible. When the Bible says that there that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's not the same word as received over there in John the first chapter, as many as received him. That word means to take hold of, but you can't take hold of God until you're alive. What was I going to give you? Something I forgot. I got too many words going through my head. We're predestined. Oh, receiveth. First Corinthians two fourteen. The natural man, the P S P S U C H I K O S, P S U C H I K O S. The physical man. The man of the senses. The natural man. That's the, way, that's the way the King James Bible puts it. The natural man does not receive. The man who's dead in his sin does not receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. Whatever receives, you can't do when you're dead in your sin. Whatever this word means, you can't do when you're dead. This completely disproves accept Christ because this word is the word dekomai. Dek is the word ten in the Greek. Decade is the word ten years. Dekalog is the word is the word deka and logos. Ten words, ten commandments. That's ten commandments. Here's ten years. Deck is the word ten. Dekomai, the word receive, means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. This is what the Bible says you can't accept Christ. The dead man does not accept anything spiritual. If you don't believe this, you're antichrist. First John two twenty two. He that denieth Christ is antichrist. Denies the word arneomai. It means to. I'll get it in a minute. He that denieth Christ contradicts Christ and His Word that makes you Antichrist. Has anybody been here Antichrist besides me? Even now there are many Antichrists and God doesn't want us to be Antichrist. He wants us to believe Him over all the people in the world. If His Word is true, if what I'm giving you is not true, the New Testament is not true, the Greek text is not true, there is no truth, throw your Bible and go party the rest of your life. When you're putting these Greek words on the board, I'm giving you, I'm breaking this thing down into words, into Greek words, into text. There is no getting around it. You can bring the best theological teachers in here and they can talk in circles while they sit there, but they will not deal directly head on with these words. You can go to most Greek classes and say, what about predestinate? When are we going to talk about pro -ho red zone? They'll go, oh, Oh, well, now wait, now, wait a minute. Now, that's controversial. Even the Greek professors will do that, yeah. won't they? Yeah. We've got people here that have gone to Greek classes where the professors did that. Well, we can't deal with that. That's controversial. It, it is not because you don't like it. That, does that make me mad? Yes. Don't call yourself a preacher and, or a teacher of truth and then not be willing to deal with anything in the Scriptures. Well, we have got the biggest mess in America. You think America's okay? And people say, we're a Christian nation. Where? Where do you find Christianity? Without a daily cross, you can't be a Christian. Well, I thought God loved everybody in the world. No, He does not. He absolutely does not love everybody. The Bible says, Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. Ephesians 5.25, it says it in the King James text, but it's the word A-U-T-A-D-A, and that's her. 
it's a form of auto, which is self, and you've got you got masculine, feminine, neuter, gender, and you change the word endings for the gender on the word. So he died for her. He did not die for everybody, and he did not love everybody. Why is it everybody don't like that? It's because they don't like what the Bible says in Romans 9. Out of a King James Bible, in Romans 9, how many times have I quoted this? Verse 9, For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. It's talking about Jacob and Esau about to be born. They're twins in Rebekah's womb. And before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, not the purpose of man, that the purpose of God, the prothesis is the word pur purpose, prothesis, P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. Prothesis, tithome. I already gave you that word before. It means to lay out beforehand. That God's purpose that He has laid out beforehand That the purpose of God, according to election, eclectos, <coughs> might stand. Eclectos means to favor. You mean God favored some people and not others? Well, certainly He did. If He didn't, then there's no such thing as grace. Certainly He purposed things. Certainly He favored some over others. The very word grace, charis, means unmerited favor caris grace you know what the grace of God is when he picks out picks one of us out chooses us before the foundation of the world births us by his will and says now I'm going to cause you to live righteously and put you through years of fire and trials predestination is not about going to heaven no matter what you do it's about God picking His people, birthing them, and then putting them into foreign trials and say, I'm going to mature you and make you be like Jesus. That's what predestination is about. We've been predestined to be conformed. To be conformed to the image of Christ. To the image of His Son. Icon, the likeness. You're going to be like Christ if you belong to Him and it ain't going to be a matter whether you like it or not. He's going to make you like it. He's going to put the like in you. I like what I am today a lot better than I did when I, when I was 30. I don't like the Jim Brown of 30 years old. I was a young preacher and thought I had it together. I was a smart aleck. But you know what? I didn't think I was at the time. I thought I had it together. I didn't have anything together. When you think you know something, you know nothing as yet as you ought to know. We think we know. And what was the likeness of Jesus? Did He bear a cross? Huh? If any man will come after Him, let him die himself and take up his cross every day, daily. That's the daily cross that men hate. Isn't it? That's the one they hate. Taking up the daily cross, telling truth, talking truth, living in truth, and being persecuted for it. People hate the idea of being hated. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it will hate you. Didn't He say that in John 15? Start in verse 18. Does the world have to hate us? It is absolute necessity. You have to be hated somewhere by somebody for telling somebody the truth sometime. Say, Jim, I, I can't do like you do and go out and talk to everybody in the grocery stores and everybody in the department stores. Well, you don't have to do that. If you're a mother or you're a, you're a wife and you're trying to take care of the house or you're... You're working on the job. You say what you can say. You don't go out to beat people up. You go out and say a few words of truth. And somehow, somewhere along the way, somebody is going to put you on a cross and you're going to be like Jesus. Predestination is about us being like Christ. And He did have a people that He foreknew that He's, going to predeter that he's predetermined, us, pre predetermined that for us. Second Thessalonians 2.13 We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 
God has done all of this. Nobody here, can someone here tell me you determined your salvation? Can anybody here say that? Did you birth yourself? Are you actually making yourself live righteously if God don't do something to you and cause you to do that? What you're doing is contradicting the Word of God if you say that. Are any preachers preaching this? I don't hear anybody. I am the biggest fool in America to preach as hard as I preach if it's not true. This does nothing but make mostly enemies. A lot of people want to kill me. Did you know that? I got people who would kill me if they could punch a button and they could get by with it. They'd, they would erase me from the human race. You can't preach that God doesn't love everybody. Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and be liked by the world. I'm not doing this because I'm having fun. I'm doing it because God absolutely requires me to do it. But he had to convince me through years of fire and trials and he nearly killed me several times. If God will deal with you, you'll get on your face. You won't, after you're going through years of trial and you land in your bed and you land in your bed and you die of cancer and your neck's broke and, you, and your wife just left you and you and your house burnt down and you didn't have any insurance and you're laying there and you're saying, I know, I'm going to do this all by my free will. I'm going to get out of the hospital and get well and I'm going to overcome this. I'll tell you what, if God does that to you, He'll make you look to Him, won't He? And you won't be sitting around arguing theology, will you? That's where, where it comes to. So, we're going to be conformed to His image or His likeness and we're going to be like Jesus and take our cross and die daily, aren't we? Crosses come from telling the truth. That's where they come from. I know you're not going to... God has given to every one of His elect a measure of faith. But He hasn't given everybody the same measure. I've said that over and over again. Faith is death to self, isn't it? It believes God and doesn't believe self. Well, faith has to grow, doesn't it? According to Luke 17, chapter, the Lord increase our faith. and The Lord tells them how their faith has increased. And Peter says in 2 Peter uh, 1 and 5, Besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And he names seven things you have to add to your faith. And that takes a lifetime to add all this maturity and, and this temperance and this growing up. It takes a lifetime to add that. So just because somebody doesn't have as much faith as you've got, they're exactly where they're supposed to be. But they're not supposed to stay there and neither are you. We're supposed to be growing. The older I get, the more my faith grows and the less I care about whether people believe the truth. I'm preaching up here not to cause you to believe the truth. I'm preaching here because this is what God says. And if I tell the truth straight, now I'm straightforward with it, it's going to connect with some people's lives. People say, what's the use of preaching then if you're predestined? Preaching the gospel is the method by which God will cause, call His elect to Him. And He'll cause that word to go out wherever He wants it to go. And then He says, it will not return to me a void. It will accomplish where to I send it. It's going to accomplish what He wants it to accomplish. Whether you believe or not or whether you don't believe, that's neither here nor there to me. People say, you can't convince me. I don't even believe in convincing you. If God doesn't convince you, I don't want to. I don't want you to go to heaven if God don't want you to go. I don't want my mother to go if God don't want her to go. Do you want God that much? Do you want the will of God that much in your life? Say, I don't want my kids to go if God don't want them to go. I've got a daughter. She'll be 51 years this year. She's somewhere on the other side of the world. I don't even know where she is. She's probably going to hell one day. She does not like this message. That's it. What am I going to do about it? Nothing. I've got some sons and daughters here, though, that I wouldn't trade you for her. Because my brothers and sisters, my sons and daughters, are those who do the will of the Father. Now, how much time do I have, Mike? Look here. I might as well go ahead and put John 3.16 on the board since I put everything else in. I think I've stuck... I think I've put, I think I've put more predestination verses in this this morning than I've ever put in a message. I don't know. Maybe I haven't. Sometimes I'll preach and I'll... John 3.16 does not say God loves everybody in the world. It does not say that. It says... No, turn over to John 
You can't read John 3.16 without reading John 3.14. It's impossible, really. John 3.14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Who did he lift up the serpent to in the wilderness? Huh? Who did he lift it up to? He lifted it up to Israel, didn't he? Did he lift up the serpent in the wilderness to the Moabites or to the, to the Malachites or to the Egyptians? No. And all of the, and all of the, all of the uh, Israelites weren't believers. When they left Egypt, there's probably around 4,000 people that went. Moses leads them straight into a desert with no food and no water and no way of getting away from Pharaoh's army. But they did, and they ate, and they drank. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And you'll find this in Numbers, the 21st chapter, when the people were murmuring against God, and God, chat, and God sends these fiery serpents, or poisonous serpents, in the camp of the Israelites, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. That, now, that's not John 3.16. That's John 3.15 referring back John 3.14. Those that believed in the wilderness, they looked. The Scripture says, look and live. So the ones that looked, the seeing eye, and the ones that heard the voice of God, says, look and live, the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord hath made even both of them. Only the ones that looked with the eye of faith to see. But God had to put it in their hearts to see, didn't it? And he's not talking to all the world. He's only talking to the believers in Israel, isn't he? So that's referring back to John 3, 14. Then John 3, 16 says, For God so... There's the difference in God loving all the world. Huta. It's got the diacritical mark, the H sound. Huta is the word so. It's an adverb. Adverbs tell how, when, where, and sometimes why. How, when, where, why. And they modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. That's not really advanced. I learned that in about the 11th grade back in 1955, something like that. All I'm doing is giving you some basic English from 400 years ago, about 50 years ago anyway, 55 years ago. All right. It, this word so tells how or in what fashion. In the same fashion he loved in the wilderness, that word so means in what fashion the same way he loved those in the wilderness the ones that he gave seeing eyes and ears to hear for God in this fashion loved the world I am the only preacher in my entire life that I have ever heard exegete all the words of John 3.16. I've never heard a preacher deal with them. Not one. John MacArthur made the statement, how can God love Jacob and hate Esau and love everybody in the world at the same time? John, you've disappointed me. He said, that's none of your business. What do you mean that's none of our business? He's saying God is so puzzling that God can love everybody, referring to John 3.16, and that he can love Jacob and hate Esau at the same time. That's absolutely not true, John. John, you haven't even looked at the word so. God in this fashion loved the world. You had not even looked at the word loved. It's the word agapo. A-G-A. <clears throat> A-G-A-P-E-O. Agapao. It's the verb form of agape. You have two words, phileo and agape. Both of these words have been ambiguously translated into one word, love. Sometimes this word, this word agape is translated into the word charity. There in the 13th chapter of 
1 Corinthians. So anytime you see charity, you'll know that's agape. Whenever you see love, you've got to see whether it's phileo or agape. Phileo means to have affection for or to like. Like. Agape has to do with an, an affection only when you're keeping the laws of a father, of a family, or of a king, as, or of a king as he delegates to his subject. Because the Bible says in 2 John 6, 2 John 6, this is love. This is what love is equal to, or agape. Here's what agape is. You have to go into the text. You, how can you do that? You either go into a concordance or you go in an interlinear Bible and look at the Greek text and I can show you how to do that. This is agape. He's saying agape equals. Here's what he's saying. Agape equals. If I say this is, that's the same thing as equal, isn't it? Agape equals walking in the commandments of God. This is agape, that we walk after His commandments. So when God loves somebody, He's going to cause them to walk in His commandments, and that's conforming to the likeness of Jesus, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. So God, in this fashion, gave His commandments to the world. He gave His commandments to the world this is what John 3, 3.16 actually says. I don't care what you preachers out there are saying. The Bible is not written in English. For God so loved the cosmos. Actually, when you go into the interlinear Bible, the word endings are changed depending on the character of the word. When you look this up in Strong's Concordance, in the Greek language, you take the word the... You've got, math, you've, got, you've got singular, plural, masculine, and feminine, neuter, gender, and the singular, masculine, and male, uh, feminine, female, neuter, which is a table, has no gender. And you have masculine, feminine, neuter, gender under the plural, masculine, feminine, neuter, gender under the singular, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative case. Well, nominative is the subject of the sentence of the predicate nominative. This genitive shows possession, baptism of repentance, of repentance, means true repentance belongs to whatever true baptism is. And then dative is the indirect object, accusative is the direct object, receives the action of the verb, Jim threw the ball. The ball. Ball is the direct object. Or Jim threw John the ball. He didn't throw John, John is the indirect object, shows who he threw it to, so that'd be dative case. So you got 24 ways just to spell the word the. The word that Mr. Strong always gives you, he gives you masculine gender, singular, nominative case. That's what he gives you. For the exact word, you've got to go into an interlinear Bible. You go in and look at the top line, and it'll give you the English. You can look at the top line, and you get the exact spelling of the word, then go to a parsing guide, and what it actually says, in the Strong's it says cosmos. Actually the word, and Mr. Strong can't give you all of the word endings, because if he did it would take a trailer full of books to carry your concordance with you anywhere you went. So when you go into the interlinear Bible it says cosmon. I'm going to spell it like it is in the Greek, K-O-S-M-O-N. Okay, that's Greek there. Cosmon, O-N, means masculine and gender. Cosmos, or cosmon, means orderly arrangement. It doesn't mean dirt, globe, dust. doesn't mean earth. Orderly arrangement. This is what it means. You can't get any scholar in the world and disprove this. It's impossible. It's kind of like getting some, if I can find the right guy, he can prove George Washington was the father of our country. If I get somebody, uh, they, can, they can tell me that uh, the Civil War, they can prove the Civil War wasn't fought in the 1800s. No, you can't. No more, you, you can't prove this wrong. World, cosmon, means orderly arrangement, masculine gender. It means the orderly arrangement of mankind. God in this fashion, 
the same fashion where they looked and lived in the Old Testament, only the Jews is the only one he's preaching to, and he's only preaching to the ones that can see and hear. Look and live, he said. For God in this same fashion loved or gave his commandments. Who did God love? Jacob. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. Who did God give His commandments to? Israel. How many of them did He give to Esau? None. He didn't love Esau. But if you don't know what love is, you're lost as a goose on this, aren't you? Whatever lost that is, I don't know. <laughs> So He gave His commandments to Israel. And everyone He loves, He chastens and scourges, doesn't He? In Hebrews 12. That we might be partakers of His holiness. If He loves you, He's going to beat you with an inch of your life till He causes you to believe Him. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say God loved everybody in the world. It says God in this fashion gave His commandments through the orderly arrangement of mankind. Who in the arrangement of mankind did He give His commandments to? His elect, didn't He? Yep. He's elected us on to obedience. To what? First Peter 1 and 2. He's elected us to, to obedience and the sprinkling of blood. A blood baptism was a martyrdom. If you've been elected of God, you've been elected to die daily. Boy, this is too hard to take, isn't it? If a man don't believe it, it's too hard to take. I don't like that. Then you'll have to... Go leave here and go to hell one day. You have to embrace the truth of God. And men will be hunger, hungry for this message. For God in this fashion loved the orderly arrangement of mankind. It doesn't say that whosoever believeth in Him. It does not say that in the Greek text. If it said that whosoever believeth, that would sound like a man have a choice, doesn't it? It doesn't say that. The way the Greek text. And why didn't they translate it that way? Well, the King James was translated in a translating room by 53 scholars. About six of them dropped out, I believe it was. And when they dropped out, they left about 47. And half of them were Roman Catholics and half of them were Calvinists. Can you imagine the brawl they had? It was a knock-down, drag-out, and a whole lot of compromise. They couldn't, they couldn't translate it exactly right. Besides that, you can't translate Greek into English. How are you going to translate 24 ways to spell the? We got one way, T-H-E. They had 24 ways to spell it, depending on what gender it was, where it was in the sentence. What it was singular or plural. You can't even translate that, can you? Utterly impossible. For God so loved the world, or in this fashion gave His commandments to the order and arrangement of man. The people He gave His commandments to, how do you think He gave them to us? Did He write them on fleshy tables of our heart there in Second Corinthians, the third chapter? Yes. He wrote them. Do you have anything to do with writing His commandments on your heart? No. no. He writes them on our hearts, has some preacher preach, and our hearts open up, and we're wondering, how did this happen? Why do I believe and nobody else believes? Why do I believe in this guy here and that guy there and that guy over there doesn't believe? I'm not up here to convince anybody of anything. I'm telling you, we must believe the Word of God. Believe in Jesus, don't believe. I believe in Jesus. What do you say? I don't know. I don't care. I believe in Him. No, you don't. If you believe Him, you'll believe His words. He is the living Word. This is the written Word. You'll believe His book, won't you? And you'll have a hunger for it. There'll be a hunger in your heart to know what does the Word of God say. It doesn't say whosoever. Whosoever, that is a terrible word. I hate that word. Usually most people connect it with will, don't they? Whosoever will may come. No, that's not true. Whosoever has the will is permitted to come. You don't have any will unless he puts the will in you. Are you willing? Yes. You have an existence? Yes. Who made you exist? He did. Therefore, He made the will in you, didn't He? Because to be is to exist, and will is a form of the verb to be. It doesn't say whosoever will. For God in this fashion loved the orderly arrangement of mankind that it actually says that the believing 
all shall have everlasting life. The is an adjective. Believing is a participle, which is a verbal adjective in the Greek. Not in the, it can be an adjective or it can be a verb in the Greek, but it is always. This is a, believing is a, an adjective also. It's an ing word that acts as an adjective. Adjective. So the believing modifies. Adjectives modify verbs, uh, modify nouns and pronouns. It modifies this noun all. There's one, this is singular, this is singular, believing is singular, and all is singular. There's one specific believing all. Who is that? John 6, 37. This word all is pos. John 6, 37. 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. All. Pos. The all of John 6.37 is the all of John 3.16. And it, it's the same people of all that the Father has given me, of pos that the Father has given me, John 6.39. I won't lose any of them. It's the same thing, not willing that any of us should perish. God's not willing that... If there's a flock of sheep out here, how many does it take to make up of the flock? All of them, doesn't it? If there's a hundred in the flock, it takes all hundred of them. And God has an exact number that He's chosen before the foundation world. Those are the only ones He's going to convict their hearts to live righteously and godly. And He's going to birth them by His will. How do I know I've been born again? You're going to have a birth from above that opposes your flesh and wants to live godly and righteously. Somewhere in your life. Or you may go off and live for self for some years like I did. Has anybody done that besides me? Or would you like to lie? If you're, if you're very old at all, you'll live some years for yourself. And it says that the believing all, there's no condition in it. There's a particular specific all that will believe all that the Father giveth shall come. And Jesus said, I pray not for the world. Look at John 6, 30. Six, look at John 17. John 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come and glor glorify thy Son that thy Son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, he has power over all flesh, evil flesh included, evil men's hearts, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, that's all that's going to have eternal life. The ones that were given to Jesus, the sheep. Goats are not sheep. They never have been sheep. They'll be separated from the goats. The sheep and the goats will be separated at the judgment. He's going to tell the sheep, and he blessed into, into these, into, unto my Father. He said, this has been given to you before the foundation of the world. And this is eternal life that they, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me in thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. You gave them to me, Father. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Jesus wasn't praying for the world. He wasn't interested in the world. He prays for his elect. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Well, what about these other people? 
They're called vessels of wrath fitted to destruction in Romans 9, 22. You can look at that if you want to. Do I have any time, Mike? Look here. Romans 9. People don't like the idea. You either believe this or you don't. Romans 9. Rebecca had conceived and God said, I love Jacob and hated Esau from verse 9 through 11. 13, he says, I love Jacob, hated Esau before either one were born. Paul says, is there unrighteousness with God? Would God be unrighteous to love one and hate the other before they were born? And then he says, God forbid. He says, I can have mercy on whom I want to. I'll have compassion on whom I want in verse 15. And then he says in verse 16, it's not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. You can't will yourself into the kingdom. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, when I take you down in the Red Sea and kill you and destroy you. That was your only purpose. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh didn't harden his own heart. God said, I will harden his heart, he will not let the people go. And then verse 19. Verse 19. That will say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? Why is God finding fault with anything if he's doing it all? Well, that's really amazing, isn't it? God can do what he wants. He'll give you, an, he'll give you a sinful nature and cause you to be willing to go out and sin and then hold you accountable for it. He's saying, you can't think the way I think. For who hath resisted his will? But nay, O man, verse 20, who art thou that repliest against God? If you said and question God as to what he does, he said, you're talking back to me. Don't you talk back to me. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Why do you think Paul would write words like this? Because he anticipates people saying, I don't like a God that does that. Now, I love verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump? We're still talking about these two boys coming out of the womb of Rebecca, their mother, their twins, Esau and Jacob. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. And Jacob was a deceiver and a liar. The man was a heel tripper. He was a heel catcher. That's what his name meant. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor Jacob and another to dishonor Esau? If God wants to do that, isn't that his business? Who are we that reply against God? What if God willing to show his wrath and make his power known, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? They have been fully account accomplished. Katartizo, K A T A R T I Z O. Fully accomplished for destruction. If you don't like this, tell God that when you get to the judgment. Just tell Him. Say, God, I don't like that. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared to glory, even us, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. God has vessels that he has afore prepared for glory. We are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 Created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Same word as... A four prepared, it's the word proetoiamazo, P R O E E T O I Z, toiamazo, M A Z O. Proetoiamazo means to fit up in advance. God has fitted us up in advance to be vessels of mercy. That's a four prepared, it's the same word there, which he hath, then we're his workmanship, which God hath before ordained. Before ordained is the word proetoiamazo. God has fitted us up in advance. Look over here in 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I'm using, this is not some cult book. This is a King James Bible I'm reading out of. Why can't pre preachers find these verses? They, can, they won't deal with them. I remember, Jim, the second time I came to a house about uh, years ago, and you said that I didn't make this stuff up. I'm a parrot. <laughs> That's what I am, I guess. 
But look here. Second, Second Peter 2, verse 10, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in lust of uncleanness and despise anybody governing them, anybody's will governing them, the word is kuriates, comes from kurios, meaning Lord, K-U-R-I-O-T-E-S. Kurios is the word Lord. It means they don't want nobody ruling them. I got my own free will, and I'll do what I will and what I please to do. You will do the will of God even if you think it's your free will. It's your self-will, and God gave you that. If a man does his self-will, God gave him that. He never gave him righteous will. Presumptuous are they. They despise governments. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Presumptuous are they. Proud, as the word means presumptuous, means daring. They're daring. You dare. How dare you contradict God? Self-will. There it is right there. They're just self-willed. They're not free-willed. The word is authodes, A-U-T-H-A-D-E-S. It's a construction of auto and hedo. What's hedonistic mean? Anything goes. Anything goes, whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. That's right. They are feel-good willed. They are for, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities doxa, glory of God, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these presumptuous men, self-willed men, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Except it's not the word made, it's the word gunea. It means Born. We get the word genomai, which means to be, to be. The word G-E-N-N-E-S-I-S, which is the word nativity in the Greek, born. They're born to be destroyed. That's what they're born for. They're self-willed. God gave them that self-will. He did not give them a righteous will. But these as natural brute beasts. Brute is the word alogos. A-L-O-G-O-S. It's a construction of logos. And the alpha privative, which negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. It means no word of God. They have no word of God because God did not write it in their heart. He did not love them. The ones he loves, he chastens and scourges. And these are the same ones when you read on down here. He says they speak evil of things that they understand not. When you speak evil of the word of God and say, I don't believe his word, that's evil. That's just, that's just as evil. A preacher will go to hell just as well as a bank robber. Just as well as an axe murder, just as well as Adolf Hitler, if he if he denies the word of God, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they <coughs> that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime, spots they are. They're spots on the love feast, blemishes, sporting themselves in their own deceivings while they feast. Sit down here at grace and truth and feast with you, having eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. They're beguiling unstable souls and heart. They have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. And he says down here in verse 17, these same men, these, these men are wells without water, clouds that are carried about with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. It's a hard word, isn't it? I don't even have to do it in Jude 4. Jude 4. This is who these men are, and that's the majority of the world. That's most preachers I know. I don't know of any preachers that even go to the Greek text, much less go to the Bible. They don't go to the Bible or the Greek text. They'll give you three verses. I've about run out of time there, but I'll just read this. Jude 4. Jude 4. Jude is one chapter. It's a sister chapter to Second Peter, the second chapter. It reads just like Second Peter, the second chapter. Talking about the same man... He says in verse 4, and then I'll quit. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation 
ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our Lord, Jesus, our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that word before ordained is the word prographo. Prographo. Graphe is the Greek word writing. It means to write. Pro means to before their names were before written down to be destroyed before the foundation of the world and our names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. I don't know how I could come up with this this morning and not, and not a bunch of this is not taught in any church in America this morning. Not this to this degree. Nobody knows what John 3.16 means. Nobody knows what 2 Peter 3.9. Nobody doesn't know. Seems like hardly anybody knows that God doesn't love everybody. You want to make somebody mad, walk up to them and say, did you know that God doesn't love everybody? Why? <laughs> yeah. Whew, ah. and they'll breathe and huff and puff. And I think they do that because they think maybe that God don't love them. If God loves you, He's going to scourge you and cause you to be willing to call out to Him. And you're going to be willing to live God in righteously before your life is done. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and for truth. God, help us to continue this message, Lord. Overthrow our wills and our desires. We know that's what You're going to do, Lord. We, we pray, Lord, according to Your mercy and Your will, that You'll cause us to live righteously and seek Your truth continually from now on. Lord, I pray for the elect that they'll be strengthened in the faith. Those that are here, those in the church, we know You're strengthening them, Lord, but teach them to listen to this truth so they'll become strong in the Word. And Lord, we'll give You praise for everything. Lead us to Your elect. You have an elect family out there. Just lead us to them. Our job is to give the Word out, Lord. You'll do the converting. Thank You for truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're glad to, glad to have you here. Yeah, yeah. I, been, I was listening to you there, and you were talking about you wanting to build a church. The what? You, have you got some land for your church yet? No, we don't have yet.